Hello everybody and welcome to another game design video. So recently, uh, Mark Rosewater had a talk at the Game Developers Conference at the GDC. Uh, and if you don't know who he is, he's the head designer for Magic the Gathering. And he talked about... Uh, 20, he's been designing Magic now for more than 20 years. And he gave a talk called 20 Years and 20 Lessons in Game Design. It is an amazing video. It's about an hour long. If you like game design at all uh, or are interested in it, watch this video. I'll link it down below. Um, I'll probably do a whole video series kind of breaking out some of the things that he, some of the lessons and rules that he talked about and, you know, do some comparisons into to Warhammer and, and things like that because I feel like there's a lot of, there's a lot of juice there to be squeezed uh, when we relate it to Warhammer. But today, we're going to talk about the value of hate and why your game should have things in them that people hate. And by the way, I don't mean dislike. I mean out and out hate. So the specific rule we're going to touch on that he uh, talks about is number 11. If everyone likes your game, but no one loves it, it will fail. Uh, that is, it's such a good rule. It's such a good lesson. And I hope by the end of this that you'll agree with me that having people hate some elements of your game could be the most important thing to a game's long-term success. All right? So, let's get into it. All right, so first we'll do a little recap of something he covers in the video. If you did, as I said, and you already went and watched the video, uh, then this is going to be recap for you. But for those of you who haven't watched it yet, we're going to go through this. So, they, uh, internally, in Magic R&D, they do what's called the Magic Card Rare Evaluation. And this is sort of a phase in the design of a set. In it, magic rare cards, so, you know, the rare cards and mythic rares, are evaluated by internal WotC employees who play magic, but who aren't on the R&D team for that set. And each is rated 1 through 10, 1 being it's a piece of trash, 10 being it's just fantastic, right? So we're gonna, I'm going to give you the same scenario he gives you in the, uh, in the video. Which one of these two is better? A card that comes back with a fairly standard bell curve, but gathering around seven, so most of which are sevens, or even all of which are sevens. Or an inverse bell curve with 50-50 ones and twos, so 50% of the people thought it was absolute trash, and 50% of the people answered nine to ten. Thought it was absolutely stunning, amazing. Which one of these two is better? I'll give you a moment. All right, you had your moment. It's this one. Okay, and the reason that that's true, okay, is because those nines and tens, to get to a nine or ten, it has to be so deeply appealing to the individual psychology of that person that it connected with them on a very deep and real level, aesthetically, narratively, rule-wise, whatever it is that they attach to, probably a combination of all of them, honestly, to get to a 9 or 10. Um, they loved everything about it. The problem is 9s and 10s are mutually exclusive. Because they're so deeply connected to an individual's psychology, there are going to be another group of players who are also invested in the game, but for a completely different set of reasons. So if you go back to my psychographic profile video, the, the uh, Spike, Johnny, and Timmy, right, uh, video, which I'll link that below as well, um, the, th let's, let's take a card that, that Timmy looks at and he's like, oh, the card is amazing. It's big and it's explosive and it's random and it really allows me to experience something just totally unique. It's crazy. It's a crazy card and super wacky and fun and weird. All right. And that's why Timmy loves it. Uh, the problem is that Spike is going to look at that same card and go, that card's explosive and random and weird. And I hate everything about it because I don't like any of that. Right. So both of them have put their finger on the same facts. They've both pointed to the same truth. The truth of the matter is not in question. One of them, though, has the reaction of, ugh, boo, hate it. And one of them has the reaction of, yay, best thing ever. Right? The point being is that this 
strong reactions of love and hate, right? These incredibly intense reactions get provoked and create engagement with a thing. And they only happen with either a deep connection or a deep revulsion. The worst thing you can do isn't it isn't have those sort of negatives present in the game in your game elements it's have no negatives and no extreme positives present in your game is having it be just good now let me make that true by analogy to it to, to something else so i'm a big fan of mr sunday movies on youtube he and so if you know his channel uh and their movie system for a long time was best movie ever worst movie ever Around the time of the most recent Star Wars movie release, they said the worst case scenario isn't that we get another set of the prequels. One, because that's probably not going to happen. It just wouldn't. And two, because the prequels, when I said prequels, chances are you had some kind of strong reaction. Now, it was probably negative. A lot of people don't like those movies. Although there are people who really deeply love them and will come out and vociferously defend them. But that's exactly the point, right? The prequels came out 15 years ago. And yet, people will still get in passionate arguments about them. Okay? Movies that came out 15 years ago and were just pretty good. Like, there were a seven. Straight seven. Are forgettable. We don't talk about them. They didn't stand out. There was nothing that memorable about them. Their great sin wasn't what wasn't that uh, that they had bad things in them. They didn't, or they had so few of them as as to be irrelevant. Their great sin was they didn't push the envelope and have great things in them that other that some other people watching it would have hated. Right. So this is true in movies and books and kind of all kinds of art and certainly true in game design as well. Having those elements that are so super strong is what makes it so people have that visceral reaction. And when they have that visceral reaction, they become engaged. Because when people come out and attack, then you, if you love it, will defend. And we're going to talk more about that here in a little while and how that can also then draw you deeper into the experience of the game. All right, minimizing the hate. So you might ask the question, shouldn't game designers seek to limit sort of the negative responses to, the, to their game, be it the rules, the aesthetic, whatever, All right? Well, my answer is yes, but only to a point, right? If you're getting overwhelming negative, think back to that first slide. This first slide, when in, in the example Rosewater gives is 50 50, meaning it's equal. If it drifts above that to any significant degree, if it's 70 30 hate to love, you should seriously start asking questions about how that game element is designed. Because now, all of a sudden, that game element is becoming largely hated. One of the big things that can make this drift over that line, by the way, is when that game element can't be avoided. If there's an individual magic card you hate, you can just not play that card. You might have to play against it, but you don't have to play it. It's not, it doesn't have to be one of your choices. You can ignore it. Same thing's true for an army in Warhammer, right? Or something like that. If you particularly hate some army, some faction, some whatever, in, in any version of Warhammer ever, okay, you just don't collect it. But you might have to face it on the table every so often. But you don't have to but you don't have to use it yourself personally. You don't form any any attachment to it. And moreover, when you do end up facing it, whether it be that card that you hate, that army that you hate, whatever, in any game, and it sucks, all it does is prove you right and you feel better about yourself. You get sort of an Oscar the Grouch syndrome, right? I think of like Ant from the Sustainable Center when he when his ten things I hate about Skaven video. Um you know, Ant for the longest time had a real passionate hatred for Skaven. And when he would fight them, and they would do their Skaven shenanigans, and everything he believed about them was suddenly proved true, he felt better about it. 
because his hate was given validity, right? So I mentioned Star Wars on the last slide. I personally love Star Wars, right? But there are actually people who really hate Star Wars, shockingly, um, who just think it's dumb. And I've met them. I don't understand them. Those people are a mystery to me. Um, they're like people who really love kale. I just don't get it. But, you know, they're out there. The trick with Star Wars is it's way in the other direction, right? Like, with the overall thing, it was very... It took a lot of previous elements and combined them. Whatever it was, it came together into this magical, you know, lightning in a bottle formula. But And it produced these very strong reactions of love. It also produced some serious hate. But people really got invested. That's why when the prequels came out and a lot of people felt they didn't live up to it, there was such a visceral reaction to that. Right? Imagine a world with no regular original Star Wars trilogy. And then the prequels come out, if you can. Let's, let's go into this thought experiment where only the prequels exist. Would we have hated them as much? Would we have even cared? Probably not. They just, they probably wouldn't be bad enough to even remember. It's only when held against the reflection of the original trilogy and the expectations that it set that so many people got so angry, right? And the funny thing about the hate and love sort of cycle and the investment is it can go the other direction, right? Uh, so this is Best Worst Movie, which is a documentary about the making of Troll 2, um, which, as the little uh, the little log line up top says, is the uh, worst movie ever made. And it is pretty freaking terrible, uh, if you've ever seen it. Troll 2 is more or less unredeemably bad. And yet, people love this movie. There are people who go to film festivals and stuff and get together and have, you know, like you can see the little Alamo Draft House there, because the Alamo Draft House would host these movie nights where everybody would come watch Troll 2. Perhaps some ironically, maybe I maybe almost completely ironically, but I think there are a lot of people who aren't even watching this ironically anymore, <laughs> is really the truth. And they, this movie, this terrible movie, enough people responded in the reverse of loving it so much, they made a freaking documentary about it. This took lots of hours and money and work to make a documentary about this thing, right? Think about how crazy that is. And then think about all the middle-of-the-road stuff. The stuff that's just pretty good or it's bad, but it's just like, it's not terrible. It's just, eh, it's just there, right? Those things that are just a movie or just a game or whatever, right? They're great, but they don't do anything that original. We've all played these games. Like, we've all, maybe if you did, maybe if you've played a lot of miniatures games or RPGs like I have, you've undoubtedly played some games that you played and you were like, yeah, this is cool. There was nothing that you loved or hated about it. It was just good. S solid seven. And you probably didn't play it very long. Or you probably don't remember that movie. If I ask you to remember a movie from 2010 or 11 or 12 or 13, somewhere in that range, that was just average. It was, it was good, even. Go ahead probably can't get a list. You might have went to see a bunch of them, but they just don't stick, right? Because in the end, they just end up being cotton candy. They're good. They could be good. They could even be fairly without flaw, but there's nothing that engendered that visceral reaction. And so they just kind of fade away. All right. Through passion, I gain strength. Uh, I'll leave somebody to comment below what that's a quote from. I'm sure most people watching this know, or I hope you do. Um, items that are stranger or push the envelope or explore new ground, when used in the right moderation, cause hate. And we're, I'm going to talk more about moderation here uh, on the next slide. But it's funny, like, what I mean by that is when used correctly, 
they cause hate because people simply fear change or the new or something different or something outside, whatever their expectations are. The trick is at the same time you make that hate, you also make passionate supporters who become more engaged because they are actively having to defend a thing they love, right? They have to come out and engage in a social way and push back against the hate and say, no, I love this thing and here's why. And in enumerating the reasons, in vociferously arguing for it, they actually increase their own attachment to the thing. Okay? And we can all probably remember a time where we said, like, we thought something was pretty good, and then someone else said, that's dumb. And you went, no, it's great. And slowly your position got more extreme, right? Because there's just a lot of psychological research that that's how human beings work for whatever reason. So, the point being is that these, by forcing people into a position where they have these strong responses, they become active participants in the game. They become more attached. It breeds attachment, not just because they love it and it speaks to them. That's true. But also because they have, they are like, they sort of actively stem the tide against those who hate it. There are limits to this significant limits they can become crippling. We're going to talk about the dark side here in just a moment. But over on the right, I want to talk about my picture here. This is a, a little gnome bard. He came out of third edition. Gnomes and bards are two fairly controversial elements in the history of D&D. There's a lot of people who don't like them. Um, the, the sort of vanilla in uh, in D&D is, are, are fighters, wizards, clerics, and rogues. And then, you know, your humans, elves, dwarves, and halflings. Sort of the traditional races and traditional classes. The gnome and the bard are always the ever fifth wheel, right? And because of that, there's a lot of people who don't like them very much. In fact, there are people who actively really hate them. But there are people like me who, because they're the weirdos or the oddballs or whatever, for whatever reasons... Just attached to the thing. And bards are one of those things. When I hear people slag off on bards, I stand up and defend them because they that as a character archetype means so much to me. I've played so many fun, engaging bards that I truly loved experiencing. Uh, you know, and gnomes are much the same. Ironically, Gnome Bard is where that kind of landed. Like, Gnome sort of iconic became a bard, which I thought was very funny. It's all the, it's the perfect storm of things people hate, all coming together into one package to, to create this most visceral response. So I, what I would say is when you think about something you hate, think about whether or not other people might really love it for the same reasons. So I mentioned the dark side. Let's get to it. Put, so there's two different dark sides. I'm going to cover what I think is the, the lesser evil first. Um, pushing these extreme elements too far, making your whole game out of them, has just as many negative or destructive consequences. When you look at magic sets, they have these extreme weird cards that would elicit these visceral responses, but at the same time, they also have just plenty of vanilla 2-2 creatures, right? Just like a 2-2 like a for 2, the old grizzly bear. Right. Sets coming out today. There are there are more than 15,000 cards in magic. I don't know how many grizzly bears there are, but there's a lot. <laughs> there's a lot of different two twos for two. Um, and they still make new ones. Do they need to? Can't can't we just rely on the huge like you could make more than a deck of two twos for two at this point. Way more. Can't we just rely on those? The answer is no. Because sandwiches need bread. Right? The fact that every other sandwich existed had bread doesn't mean that this sandwich shouldn't have bread. Now, I understand there are sandwiches without bread and people who diets and blah, 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 blah. Don't get too hung up on the analogy. The point being is that you need the filler. You need the vanilla, normal, regular filler that evens everything else out, the non-controversial middle ground in your game 
be it aesthetic, be it uh, game rules. You know, if every single game rule in your game is totally amazing and new and creative and totally different and complex, congratulations on your failure of a game. Because there's no reward in game design for that kind of originality, unfortunately. Because I don't... Like, I have some kind of expectations I'm going to bring to the game. And if you constantly defy them at every turn and make me learn something unlike anything I've experienced before for every single element of the game, I I just don't have the time. And people are just going to not be interested. There's too much. Too much of that new stuff that pushes it. So the image I've got here is of a game called Mechanical Dream, which I will link the Wikipedia for below. I would highly encourage you to go read the Wikipedia synopsis of this game. Now, this game gets fairly high reviews if you search around. There's not a huge number of them, but the the reviews that are out there are fairly positive. That being said, this game failed pretty horribly, pretty pretty completely. Um, It was reviewed well by all accounts. It was put together very well. It was well designed, but it failed. Um, And by the way, I'm not endorsing this game because... There's a whole lot of background around the company and did they fail to pay people and stuff like that. So there's all this controversy. I'm, I'm not interested in all of that. Um, if, if they engaged in shady business practices, that's terrible. Um, but my point is more around just the nature of the game. One of the big reasons I would put for this reason, I would mark for this, this game falling down, is it was just too out there. Everything was an expression, quote unquote, of originality and difference and extreme just sort of strangeness. And what that meant was it was just too different, right? People couldn't bring any expectations to the table. And expectations have value. That vanilla filler, that bread on the sandwich has value and that it balances everything out, right? All right, here's the darker side. Um, the darker side is when the discussion over the love or hatred of a thing becomes the only thing that gets discussed with the game. Okay. What I mean by that is we as players need to expect that there are going to be items in the game we hate. The best games, the games we love and will want to play for a long time, will have things we hate. We should expect that. However, we as players don't have a right to want or expect the game designers to just remove those things carte blanche because we hate them. Though we certainly should complain. Because as I said, if if we don't complain or discuss it, then then the game designer is never going to know what the real ratio is. Because again, it's about finding, you know, somewhere between like, 20% 20% hate and 80% positive and 50% hate and 50% positive. Somewhere in that range is probably pretty good, right? If it goes above that, if ever if we don't complain, if we don't talk about it, if we don't raise the issue, then then the designer never knows. Now, of course, in any time you're raising this in a critique or review, you should do it in a, in a, in a positive and constructive fashion. Um, you shouldn't just go on there and be like, your game sucks, it's stupid. That's, that's not helpful, thank you. Um... So, you know, you want to be constructive about the thing if you really care. Explain the reasons why you dislike the thing or you you hate the thing, frankly. Um, You can do that in a nice way. (laughs) Just, you know, whatever. But what I'll call this is the forum problem, right? Where the only real discussion about the game devolves into these elements of love and hate. When they become so much, when so much of the game are these extreme controversial topics that everything else gets lost in the noise. That's a real problem. The other darker side that I want to touch on with this is, as I mentioned earlier, one of the keys is that you want these extreme elements to be in a position where people don't have to engage with them if they want. So the image I just brought up here on the right is from the Toughest Girls in the Galaxy 2 Kickstarter. This is Sister Altari, from the, she is a heroine from the uh, the Battle Sisters. I love this drawing. I think it's 
freaking gorgeous. The the art uh, sketches for this game are beyond amazing. And the renders look just as good. That's what's incredible. Okay. Um, so when these went from the drawing to the render, there was a noticeable change. And it wasn't in the quality of the miniature. Okay. The change was in their shoes. I know that sounds weird. Stay with me. Look at her boots. They look like boots because they're basically boots, right? She's wearing boots. I just like saying boots. It's fun. Um, but when this came back in the render, the models in this army had sort of what I'll call battle heels, right? Like the heavily armored thick heels, which, by the way, are not uncommon across the across the various miniature games. The thing about those battle heels... <laughs> Is that these the battle heels engender some really really positive or it's not positive I'm sorry um, what do I want to say some really really extreme there we go responses people love and hate these things and I don't think they knew what they stepped in when they cast that I'm sure there's a good reason for why they cast it like that who knows whatever here we are but. If you go and look in the comments, there are a lot of people who are like, these need to be changed, these need to be pulled, these models all need redesigned, I'm willing to wait, I hate them, blah, 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 right? Now, on a personal level, me, I actually like them quite a bit. I think they're super fun, and I like very much the battle heels. I also like the normal boots. If those had come out, I'm pretty much fine with that too. In the end, I consider it a fairly minor detail. Um... And it's not enough to sway me either way. Honestly, I don't love or hate it. But the challenge here is that as designers, they put themselves in a rough position. Because there's no way for people who have bought this army or who were very on board for this army and back to get this army to not get those boots. Right? There's only one pair of leggies and feetsies in the kits. And they're going to have those high heels. Now, certainly they could, like, green stuff or putty over it or whatever. But that's kind of annoying, right? And people felt like that wasn't... I didn't think I had to deal with this problem of this thing I don't like. Because when you did the renders, you didn't include them. Now, of course, in the Kickstarter it says everything's subject to change and blah, 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 blah. And, you know, there's people... There's some, some controversy and discussion over, you know, do you, do you, can you get a refund for this and whatever. And I don't want to wade into those waters. Um, what I'll simply say is it's, it really is very illustrative of the challenge of what happens when one of these elements that, that people really attach onto in a positive or negative fashion, you know, transects something that they cannot, uh, get around. They cannot ignore wherein now you've painted yourself into a corner as, as the designer of this project, right? Because you can't just allow people to play around it. You've put yourself in a no-win situation. Because no matter what now, people are going to be pissed. Right? If you take them away, the people who loved them, like myself, or whatever, maybe not myself. I probably, Honestly, I wouldn't carry it away. If you take them away, but there are defenders. Those people who wanted them are going to be pissed. If you leave them, the people who don't want them are going to be pissed. And there's no good option in the middle. Um... So, this to me is, is where the real darkest side of this goes, right? Because it can become a real challenge that is just no win. So let's bring this all around. As usual, we'll close out talking about Warhammer. So we're going to talk about hate and Warhammer. What I love, one of the reasons I love this topic is because it made me think about Warhammer in a totally new way. I love thinking about the history of, of Warhammer through new lenses and, and uh, new elements of design and, and trying to understand the bottled lightning that has been the success of Warhammer. Um, it is to say to, to say it's one of the most successful games uh, across like the sort of the space of these games in history isn't a huge stretch. Um, it's been around for a long time. It's survived a lot of its kin falling by the wayside. Um, there are others also, so, you know, out there, but 
it's impressive what this what Warhammer has managed to do and and capture in this small niche market of wargaming. And to me, I think one of the reasons, maybe even the main reason, perhaps, for its success has been it's done a good job of mixing the mundane and, and rote with the extreme and polarizing, right? People have these arguments over aesthetics or the presence of certain forces or turns the narrative or whatever, like a lot, right? This discussion goes on. If you've ever visited a forum for Warhammer, you have probably heard these discussions happen. Uh, if you've ever watched a video on Warhammer, you've probably heard some form of this discussion. And they've always done a decent job of mixing the two together. Um, they've had, say, your Empire troops or your, you know, your Imperial Guard or whatever, your sort of fairly rote standard stuff, um, something that feels grounded and fairly normal, combined with these insane fantastical elements. You know, you've got these these weird giant monsters and, you know, demon creatures and, uh, you know, whatever, the extreme things out there that create the, this immediate reaction of love or hate. And by doing that, also create engagement. Let me give you a few examples, very specifically. Let's talk about Space Marines. Um, I personally hate Space Marines. I don't like them one bit. Um, this probably comes from years of playing Imperial Guard and getting my teeth kicked in by these by these guys. So it's probably pure jealousy. Um, that being said, there are uh, a huge number of people, huge, I don't need to tell you, this is obvious, who love Space Marines, who love to get into the chapters, into the lore, into the paint schemes, and who through that, and by the way, this, they can, there's also like all sorts of intra-chapter, uh, or inter chapter, I don't know, whichever one it would be, uh, fights, right? Where people are like, this chapter's terrible, this chapter's great, they love and hate certain things. They get to sort of pick their pony, right? And by having this very personal attachment to the to the thing, to the Space Marine in general, and then to the chapter in specific, it creates such an, a, a high level of psychological utility to your, your collection, to your playing the game, Right? Uh, it also doesn't hurt that they're fairly straightforward to paint and, you know, you know, easier to collect and have about the right model count in many cases. All these sorts of things work in tandem. They're, they're a rather genius sort of core uh, force for 40K. Uh, and they, they, I think, have this space in the consciousness because of the way they inspire both love and hatred, and because of the way that the unique chapters then similarly allow people to place themselves, their own sensibilities, the thing that they love, you know, at the chapter that they would join or that they love the aesthetic of or whatever, right? Stormcast. All right, let's talk about Stormcast. Um, it's ironic I would go to Stormcast right after talking about Space Marines, but here we are. Uh, Stormcast are very much the same thing in a few regards. Namely, that they're sort of Marmite, right? You either love or hate them. And there was a lot of complaints that the Stormcast were sort of the first release for Age of Sigmar, as opposed to something else. Why didn't we do elves or a human faction or something like that? And my answer to you is because that's a seven. It's boring. It's not the way to launch a game. It needs to be there. Okay? That stuff needs to exist. And the launch of the Stormcast was far from perfect. Uh, the way that they were trotted out, the non-communication of what the, the army would look like in the end, the splitting up the releases in weird ways. There's There was lots of, shall we say, opportunities in the initial Stormcast release. I'm not saying that was perfect. What I am saying is that something like the Stormcast, something completely new, completely different, and polarizing, was the right choice for the initial release of Age of Sigmar. Because think of how much love and hate they immediately created. People were either all about them or just totally hated them. Right? Now, some people left the game because of their existence, and, and that's a shame. 
Um, and I think that could have been managed better. I think that's probably a big failure of of, of GW there, not to, to better manage the expectations with them, to give better previews of the forces that those people loved and said, we're going to do cool stuff for you too. It's not all going to be, you know, the Stormcast. When we look back to the initial release, people were like, oh, is there ever going to be anything else? What about my force? <clears throat> right? And that's fair. That's a totally fair pushback because you might have been left thinking it's just all going to be like this forever. It's not. It wasn't. It hasn't been. But you didn't know any different and you weren't wrong to fear it might be. Right? So, but I think ultimately they fall into this same sort of core, right, of engendering this love and hate. Okay. So let's talk about the last example. Chaos. So chaos, as it exists in both games, functions very similarly to the way that the space marines function. That is to say, at least atta psychological attachment-wise, right? Because these forces are very unique, have a very out-there aesthetic, they're weird, they push the envelope, and they immediately engender a lot of extreme reaction. For example... I despise everything Nurgle. Hate it. Hate it with a passion. Disgusts me. That being said, there are a huge amount of people who love Nurgle and love making Nurgle armies. And more power to them. That's sweet. I am glad that they found that thing that they like. Right? For me, it was Slanesh, right? I attached to Slanesh. I, I, I love the aesthetic, the weird sensibility, the mix of like horror and... Uh, beauty, but there are a lot of people who find Slanesh just like, ugh. They, in the same way. Each of these gods is super Marmite in the way that they create visceral response. Right? And so, they're a huge, 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 unique element to, to Warhammer, to both of these, to all incarnations of Warhammer, more or less. And by the way, I don't just mean that made by GW, I mean sort of anything that's taken that that concept and run with it, you know, could be the ninth age, could be whatever. Um, their presence in the game should not be undervalued because what they create immediately are those very, very strong reactions. And I think by doing that, they also then create that attachment. Okay. So there you go. That's my thoughts on hate and why it can be good for your game. So some quick summary. Hate is a good thing as long as it's either equal to or less than the amount of love by other psychographic profiles that those game elements are creating. Um, in fact, it's not only good, it's necessary because it tells you that as long as you're in that balance or less, that you're doing the right thing. You're making things that people can really invest themselves in and become more a part of your game by attaching themselves to it, collecting it, defending it, whatever it happens to be, right? Um, it can be polarizing, but you got to watch, and that's okay. The, the challenge is if it's so polarizing it overtakes the conversation, or if it's such an ingrained part of the game that there's no way to play around it. Is if it's truly 50-50 and it can't be avoided your game is going to be on a downward spiral because 50% of your people who have to do the thing that they hate will just stop playing the game, right? Uh, it's it's the sort of thing where having that, walking a tightrope, getting that right balance is very, very important. And finally, I think this is one of those things that sets Warhammer aside, and I think Warhammer has always done really well on. So next time you think about something that you really hate in the in the game or world of Warhammer, think about maybe whether some other person really loves it and what it would mean to them. And think about, you know, your own personal loves and other people who might hate it and how that maybe balances out in the final counting. So I look forward to all of your comments below. I'd love to know what you think about this subject. As always, I, I love doing these videos almost as as much for the comments, just because it always gives me so much more to think about. So please do comment below. Give me your thoughts on the value of hate in a game and on provoking strong reactions. Uh, I'm very interested to see what everyone thinks about this. 
Uh, as always, I appreciate you watching very much. Again, I will put the links down there for Mark Rosewater's game design video as well as my uh, uh, Timmy, Johnny, and Spike video in Wargaming uh, in case you didn't see that and want to know what I was referencing there. And I will also put the Wikipedia page for Mechanical Dream up. Like I said, read it. It's it's pretty crazy. All right. So thank you, everybody, very much for watching. It's deeply appreciated. And as always, we'll see you next time.